Well, good morning and welcome to Brixington Community Church. Uh, for those of you here and um, for those of you online, uh, a really warm welcome to our harvest service this morning. Um, you can partially see uh, the display behind me that Eileen's been building as we've been, as you've been drawing uh, your gifts in this morning. So thank you uh, for your generosity today. So we've come to worship the living God. We've come to say thank you to him for his provision for our lives, for the food that we share in all that we uh, um, eat on a daily basis. Sometimes perhaps we're not as grateful as we should be, but today we can mark today as giving thanks to the Lord for his generosity to us. He provides the sun and the wind and the rain and all the seasons that we have. Sometimes they can be out of kilter a little bit, can't they, as we've been hearing in the news. Um, but generally, God provides enough water and enough sunshine for our crops to grow, which is great. So we want to give him thanks this morning to do that. And as part of our service today, we're going to be sharing communion. So if you're at home and you want to be able to do that, can I invite you to get uh, bread and wine or whatever is appropriate so that you might share with us today as we do as the body of Christ. I want to use some words from the Gospel of Mark um, that Jesus spoke uh, from chapter 4, and it says this. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground day and night. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grape is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. So we're going to sing our praises to the Lord of the harvest today. And I've chosen a classic harvest hymn, which you will all know, which is we plow the fields and scatter. So can I invite you, if you're able to stand and let's give thanks to God this morning. Thank you.
Let us pray. God of faithfulness, your generous love supplies us with the fruits of the earth in their seasons. Give us grace to be thankful for your gifts, to use them wisely, and to share our plenty with others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And Father, we ask that as uh, these gifts are received today, that you would enable us to bless others with them. That, Father, they might know something of your love and of your presence as we distribute them around our community. We ask this for Jesus' name's sake. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue in our worship by singing a couple of songs together. Blessed be your name and great is your faithfulness.
Father, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness towards us. Thank you for the many blessings that you pour into our lives day by day. Lord, we're not always thankful. Father, forgive us when we take you for granted. Forgive us when we take your blessings for granted. But Lord, today we've come to say thank you. We've come to rejoice in your goodness. We've come to lift the name of Jesus on high because he is worthy. The name that is above every other name and at the name of Jesus every knee will bow because Jesus Christ is Lord of all. We thank you, Father. We thank you because of what Jesus has done for us. Thank you that he has redeemed us, that he has set us free, that he has washed our lives in the blood of the Lamb and that we are free indeed. So Father, in that freedom, we come and offer thanks to you today for loving us, for caring for us, for pouring your spirit day by day upon us. Lord, we bless you. We bless you this morning. Maybe you want to call out blessings this morning that you've received from God with a thankful heart. Let's do that together. Lift our voices in adoration of God this morning. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy of our praise, Lord. Worthy of our praise. Our blessing. Mighty, mighty Lord. Thank you for moving in us. Thank you for moving your spirit fresh. Jesus, we bless you. We praise you. We honor you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
declare that we love you this morning, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. It's good to lift our voices in praise to the Lord, isn't it? For God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Please take your seats. We're going to uh, gather around God's Word now. So if you've got a Bible and you, or an iPad or a phone that you've got the Bible on, you might want to turn to it this morning. We're going to be reading from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be, only be looking at one verse, so it won't take very long to look at it. And you'll probably memorize it by the time I've started to the time I've finished. Hopefully you will have because it's quite short. But let's pray as we gather around God's word this morning. Father, we thank you for your living word. We thank you for the truth that it contains. And Father, we pray that you'd help us to see what your word is saying to us today. Reveal it to us, Lord, we ask. And help me and the reflections that I've had, Lord, be your words this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week... We looked at the uh, beatitude, which was, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And do you remember we said that we come to God with nothing. We come with open hands, not resting in our own self-reliance or self-worth, but trusting in the Lord Almighty. Today we're going to look at the the second beatitude, which is found in Matthew, which is on the screen. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, I've been thinking about this morning and and the phraseology around that. And I suspect like you and me, you're feeling, it's centered around the feelings of those that you've lost. That we're mournful and maybe sad and tearful at the losses that we've experienced over the years, and to be sure, we're going to continue to experience. As you know, I I had the privilege of taking my mum's committal service, uh, sorry, my stepfather's committal service, she'll shoot me for getting that wrong. (laughs) My mum's still alive, aren't you mum? Great. So I took took the privilege of taking my stepfather's committal service, and I used those very words. And there are a number of areas when grief or mournfulness is expressed, and I've thought of a few, and you might think of some more. And as I've said, grief of a loss of a loved one, uh, grief of sorrow or repentance, grief at the sense of inadequacy and loss of self-worth, Grief at the cost of love, or grief over the loss of time and opportunity, maybe regrets in there. I want to say, before we go any further, that it's really important that we give time to grief when we experience loss. Because whether that's expected or unexpected... It is, it is a painful process to go through, but it is a really important process. I've met too many people over my years in ministry and before that have got stuck in the place of grief and not being able to move on. It does take time and everybody is different. And the process of grief can be a really painful one. But actually going through it is really, really important. I've known some people try and run away from it. But you still have to face the, the, the facts of coming to terms when you lose a loved one. And sometimes that is not easy, as many of you have experienced amongst us today. It is painful. But please, grieve properly. When there is a loss, whatever the loss might be, whether a loved one, whether a situation or a circumstance, we have to grieve, then do it properly, please. I've been wrestling with this beatitude because how can you be blessed when you're mourning? Do you see the conflict here? How can you be blessed when you're mourning? Tom Wright translates the word blessed using the Beatitudes to wonderful news. So Jesus is saying, wonderful news to those who are mourning, for they will be comforted. The verse of scripture is often used at funerals, as I illustrated earlier. 
We know from the accounts of Jesus that he experienced grief for himself. In John 11, at the account of raising of Lazarus, Jesus stood outside the tomb and he wept. In Matthew 23, verses 37 to 39, when Jesus cried out because of the state of Jerusalem. In Matthew 26, 36 to 46, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he used these words, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And then finally, in Matthew 27, 46, when Jesus hung on the cross and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My point is this. Jesus knows what it feels like to go through, to grieve, and to go through the process of mourning. He's been there. He's experienced it. And when we go through it, he is by our side, enabling us to make those steps through that process of of grief. However, I think there is another meaning in our text this morning, especially if you look at the context of the verse around it. The first beatitude, as we know, is to do with our need of God and that we come to him with nothing. He is the one who saves us, redeems us and sets us free. We can do nothing because it all depends upon his grace, his mercy. I believe that verse 4 is pointing us to our sin and that we should be mournful about those areas of our lives that contradict God's word. The world we live in treats sin as something as it's okay as long as it doesn't affect others. In Slimming World, you're allowed so many sins a day. Is that right, Bradley? How many sins are you allowed a day in Slimming World? 15 to 20. Is that how many sins we live with each day? <laughs> I wonder. As we know, there are consequences of sin, which is death. But as we repent of our sins before God, in other words, saying sorry, of our words, our actions, our thoughts, maybe those deeds or broken promises that we've not completed. We can know the power of his forgiving grace in our lives. Knowing that we have been forgiven takes a massive amount of weight off our shoulders. I don't know about you, but sin weighs you down. We used to do a skit where we used to, we used to carry, have a big black bag and it was full of rubbish. And that it simulated our sin. And we used to pick the black bag up and put it on our back. And we used to trudge along the stage demonstrating that it was our sin. And then we'd go to the cross. And we'd leave our bag at the cross. And we'd say, sorry Lord for our sin. Take it away. In the next minute we were picking it back up again. And we were walking away with it. So many times people do that. So what does it mean to truly repent? It means that we have to seek God's forgiveness by first admitting our sin before him. Then we need to, to do not whatever, to do whatever it is, to turn away in the opposite direction of that sin. And looking back to God. Because when we sin, we walk away from God. When we don't sin, we walk towards God, that sense of direction. And we also need to pray that God would help us with the temptation that we've been wrestling with that's caused us to sin. In the Old Testament, people, we know people sinned, but they would, they would go to the temple and make a sin offering before the Lord to atone for their sin. In other words, an animal would be, would be killed and would, uh, the blood of the animal would be laid on the, on the um, altar to atone for their sin, for the people's sin. But it was only a temporary atonement. Jesus went to the cross. 
He went to the cross giving his life for us, shedding his blood, that once and all sacrifice that was paid for you and for me. And in the shedding of that blood, we can now experience true forgiveness of sin. When we truly confess our sin before God, he promises in Micah 7 to hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea, never to be remembered again. Also in the Old Testament, they used to put on sackcloth and ashes. Has anybody got any sackcloth with them today? Any ash? Is it something that you keep in the wardrobe that you put on? No? Maybe in the garden shed. Maybe you've got a, 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 a hessian sack in there that you use. Uh, we've got one in the garden shed. It was a bit too dirty to bring today. Otherwise, I might have brought it. That, that sense that... They were putting on sackcloth and ashes. Now, sackcloth is not the most comfortable thing to wear, is it? Has anybody worn sackcloth? Perhaps you gents have got a sackcloth suit somewhere. No? Ladies, have you got a sackcloth dress that you might wear? No. 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 It's a bit too coarse. It's a bit too rough. But why did they put it on? They put it on because they wanted to remind themselves of the the separation that had caused them between God and themselves. That sackcloth and ash was there to remind them that actually I've sinned before the Lord and I'm truly wanting to be truly repentful, truly to say sorry to God. But I wonder, have we have we lost something of that when we when we come and say sorry to God today? It's easy, isn't it, to say, get on your knees or, or sit in a quiet place and say, sorry, Lord. But it, are we truly sorry? I think there is something of the old method, I'm going to call it the old method, of putting on sackcloth that was intentional, that was purposeful, that, that actually enabled us or enabled the people to, to really seek after God. It wasn't necessarily about standing on the street corner and putting sackcloth and ash on and saying, look at me, whoa, I'm a sinner. It was more of that personal reminding that actually there was a process that we needed to go through. And I just wonder whether sometimes we skip the process, we skip the pain, because we are not necessarily mournful of the things that we've done. I'll leave that as a question. It's easy to ask for forgiveness, but is that true repentance? Joel uh, 2 says this, uh, verses 12 and 13. I'll put my glasses on. Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. You see, God is seeking a people who are brokenhearted, who have learned to mourn over their sin. Every time we sin, we demonstrate a self-centeredness, but God desires to draw us to the place where we can be free. We can be free from the grip of sin. We have to choose whether to turn out of the blackness of our sin and follow God or stay in the place that we're in. I think that rhymed. I just want to spend a few moments talking about community sin. We've um, seen, uh, well, yes, last night, I think it was, there was a community vigil held for um, the primary school teacher, Sabina Nessa, in London. People naturally wanted to gather and stand together against the violence in solidarity with others, giving the message that what has happened is completely unacceptable in our town, in our society, in our community. As we saw earlier, Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. He wept over Israel. I wonder how much do we weep over our community? When was the last time you cried out to God for Exmouth, for our neighbours, for the people down our street? I believe God is calling us to stand up and cry out in prayer for our neighbours, for our local communities and for our nation. Boy, do they need it 
at the moment. I don't know about you, but every time I've driven past the petrol pump in the last few days, there's always been a queue. I, was, I went to the rugby yesterday. I was listening to conversations as people were going past, and there was a two guys standing, standing behind me. He said, he said, my wife's car is on the red line. It's on the red line. It's probably going to go put, put, put and stop. And then I walked on and didn't hear the rest of the conversation. But the sense that it's become a talking point that because of a news reporter reporting that BP had closed the station because they'd run out of fuel, it went wild, didn't it? Despite government saying, please, don't go and buy, don't panic buy, don't go and fill your tank up unnecessarily. But what have people done? It's like a red rag to a bull, isn't it? That sense that our community needs our prayers. That sense of selfishness that has displayed itself again. Do you remember back at the beginning of the pandemic, we had the toilet roll situation? You couldn't get toilet rolls for love and money. That's where newspapers started to be useful, wasn't it? <laughs> but that, that sense that our communities need our prayer. They do. They're, they're, they're stuck in a cycle of selfishness, of, of oneness. And actually, our heart is to see them see Jesus, isn't it? To see Jesus and to see a situation redeemed. Now, we come to the, I come to the end of what I want to share, really. But at the end of this beatitude, Jesus promises something that is really important. For they will be comforted. It's a promise. For they will be comforted. Hear Jesus' words. That when we mourn over our sin, when we are sorry for the things that we have done, when we're in that place of true repentance, God will stand with us and God will redeem us because that's his promise to us. It says, um, it says in Isaiah 61, and I want to close with this, the spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from the darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. And provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty. Instead of ashes. Oil of gladness instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of despair. That promise that we find in Isaiah. That when we come before the Lord. When we are honest before God. When we are truly mournful. God turns our mourning into rejoicing. Turns our sadness into that sense of praise. Turns the ashes into oil of gladness. Because when God lifts the sin from our lives, what can we not do, what can we help but not do, is praise God, isn't it? To rejoice in him who has what he has done for us, has taken our rubbish, go back to our black sack illustration. He's taken that black sack and he's thrown it away into the deepest of sea, never to be remembered again. Praise God. That is what is God, that is what Jesus has done for you and for me. He has redeemed us at the cross. But to access that redeeming, we need to come regularly in prayer to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you, the living Savior. We come, Father, because you are the one who has set us free. You have provided a way for us to walk away from our sin, to leave it at the cross, and to know you the power of your forgiveness in the name of Jesus. So, Father, Lord, as we come to prepare in sharing communion this morning, we pray, Lord, that you would help us examine our hearts before you today. Help us to come in that right attitude 
Lord, that is not glibly or, or just, Father, in the spur of the moment, but come in all seriousness before you. What Jesus did cost him his life. Father, therefore, we come in an attitude of prayer and of reverence. We come because you are holy and we are not. But Father, as we draw closer to you, you will enable your holiness to surround us. Father, touch our lives afresh today. Help us to draw close to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing uh, a well-known a well-known hymn. Got a lot of traditional hymns this morning, which is good, isn't it? Um, when I survey the wondrous cross. But as we sing these words, can I ask you to reflect on what I've shared, so that as we come to communion, we might know the power of God's forgiveness at work in our lives today. If you want to stand, please feel free to do so. If you want to sit, then please remain seated. Let's sing together.
love so amazing, so divine. Father, we thank you for your love made perfect for us. We thank you for the transaction that took place at the cross. We thank you, Lord, that your invitation to us is to come. So we come as children of the living God, not worthy of anything that we have done. But by the blood of Jesus, we come. We thank you for all that has been achieved through the giving of his life for the pouring out of his spirit and for the way that you have touched our lives and changed them. So Father, in this moment, would you hear our cry for forgiveness? Would you touch our lives afresh this morning by your spirit? Help us to turn away from the things of the world and walk towards you again. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to share communion together. For those that are serving communion, could I invite you to come forward, please? The way we're going to do that this morning and for you at home is that I'm just going to lead us in a short time of prayer and as we reflect on the emblems together, then we're going to ask the members of the congregation to come forward to take a piece of bread and take a cup of wine, take it back to your seat, eat your bread when you're sat down, please, and then hang on to your cup that we might drink it together signifying our oneness in Christ. Everybody happy with that? And if you're struggling to get up, we will serve you in your seat. So on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Jesus' body was broken for us upon a cross. So as we eat bread today, let us remember his body that has paid the price for our forgiveness. And after supper, he took a cup of wine, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. We'll come to this point in a moment. So let's share bread and wine together. Thank you.
So as we have shared bread together, let us drink together, symbolizing our oneness in Christ. For God loves us and has paid the ultimate price for us. Let us rejoice and be glad in God's love. Amen. Let us just give thanks for what we have done and then Bill is going to come and lead us in our intercessory prayers. Gracious God, we thank you that we've been able to share in this meal of remembrance this morning, remembering what Jesus did at the cross for us. And Father, as we have received and know that cleansing touch of your spirit at work in our lives, we pray, O oh God, that you would empower us to be your hands and feet, wherever that might be, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. Father God, we are a sitting people. And we just thank you for your sacrifice for us, Lord. We thank you that you are a loving and awesome God. We thank you that by the blood of your son's death and resurrection on the cross, we are washed clean, each one of us, Lord. We just thank you for that. And we just ask you through this to hear our prayers, Lord. We thank you for this year's harvests and the harvest that's been brought here today that will help to bless some of the materially disadvantaged of Brixington and Exmouth. Please help these lovely people to realise that this food is your blessing to them. Thank you for all the outreach that goes on and that it will touch the spirits of more and more people here in Brixington and further afield. We trust you to raise up all the helpers to keep these initiatives going and to keep us being a church without walls. In a moment of quiet, we lift to you, Lord, all those who are sick physically or are struggling mentally at this time and ask for your healing hand and peace upon each one. Thank you, Lord, for the NHS. Please uphold all the staff as they prepare for the winter flu and COVID jabs. Give them resilience and help and not to be overwhelmed. We think of our government who have difficult decisions to make on all fronts. Please guide the decision makers to act with forward thinking, wisdom, discernment and compassion in all that they do. For all those peoples across the globe who live in oppression or are suffering from natural disasters or are refugees from war or terror, please comfort them in their distress and help them, Lord. And lastly, we think of our persecuted brothers and sisters across the world who sacrifice everything for their faith in you, Lord Jesus. Please be with each one in their situations and keep them strong. We thank you, our glorious Lord. Amen. So we're going to sing our concluding hymn this evening, uh, this morning. Where have I been? I didn't fall asleep just then. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Let's stand together. Thank you.
here in the power of Christ, I stand. We thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. We thank you, Lord. Lord, this service of thanks. We are so grateful for all that you have done in our lives, all that, you've, all that you are doing and all that you are going to do. As we sung earlier, you are a faithful God. We lay our lives in your hands. Guide us and lead us in whatever lies before us. May we know the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, equipping and empowering and releasing us to be your hands and feet. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. As we're in the habit of doing, we're going to share the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Bless you for watching online. God bless you. Thank you.